by fixing a mistake that I made. Um, I wrote here, let me just use this one. I, in the last moment, it was x1 and x2, and so it was in my notes, but I suddenly changed it to p1, uh, because my mind somehow slipped to phase space. So let me just fix that error. This should be x1 and x2. And this is the way we see, we, we can think of the paths, possible paths. While in the phase space, in the phase space, we are really thinking about four dimensional space. Assume that they are all perpendicular to each other, okay? I can't draw perpendicular stuff. Uh, x1, x2, x1 dot, x2 dot, okay? Dot. By dot, I mean dx1 over dx, dt, okay? This is the way we, uh, we look at Newton's laws. So this is called phase space, phase space. In this phase space, any point will actually define your state fully. So you know not only the positions, but also the velocities. Okay, so let's say for a motion in two dimensions to predict the future of the motion for one particle, you need to know x and y coordinates and x and y velocities, right? Then you can predict it and you can predict it locally. Did you follow so far? Yes? Uh, that's Newton's way of looking at things. While in the principle of least action, you know the beginning and the end point. Okay, so you know x1 and x2 at t1 and x1 and x2 at t2. So you still have four data points. Uh, I, I mean, no information is lost in two views, but in one version, you know the initial positions and velocities. In the other version, you know the initial and end positions, but you don't know velocities because velocities basically tell you the path. Okay? I just corrected this mistake. Hopefully this makes sense. Yes? So the rest is still valid. The rest is still valid. Now, Let's talk a little bit about classical electromagnetism. Just to remind you where we are in the big picture, uh, we basically dealt with the math that we are going to need. It's waiting, hopefully, dormantly there and you are doing uh, your homework exercises and you are keeping it hopefully fresh. In the meantime, we are going over classical view of physics, okay? And then there will be a modern ver view of physics, then there will be quantum physics, then there will be quantum mechanics, okay? All right, so there are Maxwell's equations and Maxwell's equations tells you that basically it tells you that light is an electromagnetic wave. <coughs> That's what it tells you. And basically it connects two fundamental constants in one expression. 1 over square root epsilon 0 mu 0 is the speed of light. This is the speed of light. This is, uh, okay, this is the speed of light. This is permittivity. This is permeability. This is related to magnetism. This is related to elec electricity, electric fields, magnetic fields. But then again, there are two sides of the same coin, okay? 
good. And the speed of light, so you can basically think of light. I will just draw you a certain version of light as a plane wave. So, so right now I'm drawing you the light as a plane wave and it's not basically a beam of light that goes like this. It's not that, it's, it's a plane wave. So what these arrows tells us that in this whole plane, in this whole plane, magnetic field is pointing in this direction. Does it make sense? So, Which way the hmm? wave what? Which way the wave Let's see. Uh, we will see it once we name which one is electric field, which one is magnetic field. Yes, they are perpendicular <coughs> to each other. And this is electric field. Okay. And this is magnetic field. <laughs> Yes, so light moves in the direction of E cross B with velocity of C, speed of light, and that direction is, this direction is also the direction of E cross B. Do you remember the cross product? You go from A to B and your thumb points where the thing goes. Sure. Uh, based on what they found this, that the light is, I mean, is constructed based on two perpendicular vector fields, or electric, electric field and magnetic Yes. It comes out of uh, Maxwell's equations. Okay? So you set up, and it was a historical thing, like electricity was developed on its own, magnetism was developed on its own, then they realized that when there's a current on the wire, the compass bends in a certain way. They realized there's a relationship, which is Faraday's law, okay? Then they also realized that there is also reciprocity. So not only change in magnetic field creates electric field, but also change in electric field creates magnetic field, okay? Since this is the case, when you just shake an electron, let's say, uh, you, you basically change the electric field, but it creates magnetic field, which was not there, right? Which creates an electric field that was not there, and it keeps propagating. So once you write down Maxwell's equations, that's basically God saying, let there be light. And then there is light. Like once you set up the equations, it's the solution to the equation. Okay, this wave is a solution to the equation. So this magnetic field and electric field is generated based on the another magnetic field and the physical magnetic field or the whole electrical magnetic For example, you can generate it by uh, hmm? an antenna, yes, for example. You can create an AC, AC current over a wire, and it will create an electromagnetic wave. Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. The energy of the electromagnetic field uh, of the, okay, the energy carried in the electromagnetic field is proportional to, ah, this is actually important. Now I remember. <coughs> so, <laughs> that's why I was telling this, now I remember. So, just like in harmonic oscillator, you, ca you could pull it as much as you want and put as much energy as you want in uh, harmonic oscillator. Similarly, you can put as little 
or as much of energy as you want in light. Okay? Make the E larger, the electric field amplitude larger, and you put larger energy in the electromagnetic field. Does it make sense? Make it smaller? What? Uh, are, are you shaking your head because that's not the case in modern view? Yes, I know. I know, this is classical electromagnetism. We are building pillars only to tumble them down. You see? Because if you don't build the pillars, you don't realize what you are tumbling with quantum mechanics. Does it make sense? Okay? Yes? All right, good. So what are some basic properties of... Um, so here's some properties. C is equal to frequency times lambda. Frequency is how many oscillations you, this wave has per unit time. And lambda is the, just this distance, right? So as we said, energy is proportional to E squared. And let's write it down. Energy of EM wave has nothing to do, classical electromagnetism, nothing to do with its frequency. Okay? This will not be the case later on. We will realize it's a bit different. Okay? So we have spectrum. So let's say we have sun here. And it's yellow. We see it as yellow only because uh, it's sending us lots and lots. Actually, okay, let me just uh, tell you. So it sends a, a lot of different wavelengths of light, right? It sends maybe red, blue, green, yellow. All of them come, right? And we can actually make a graph of this, we can write frequency here and energy of energy density, this is energy density, energy density per unit frequency, okay? So what does it mean? Uh, by the way, let's reorder this accordingly. So which one goes where? Hmm? Done? Yellow and I don't know about yellow and green. Yes? Yellow should be in between red and green. Yes, tell me. It's true. It's correct. Okay. Uh, why do we see colors? Colors are just some biological accident related to us. We just see colors because there is. Uh, there are cells that are sensitive to red light more than the others, green light more than the others, blue light more than the others. And uh, some of us don't have certain cones. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Okay. Good. So if you basically collect these ra electromagnetic radiations, and count how much of them, how much of their energy falls in between certain frequencies. Like over here, let's say the energy density is here. Over here, the energy density is here. In any case, you plot a distribution, right? So far, so good. Any questions? Yes. So I was just told this. Yes. Yes, yes. But C divided by lambda means frequency. Yes, exactly. Exactly. This, 
Exactly. So this is wrong. This is going to be wrong. You see? And we are building a pillar. Is that a good word? Pillar? Or yeah, pillar is good. So it's a pillar of classical electromagnetism. We worship it for now. Only to <laughs> only for it to tumble down later on. To erect another one that may fall again. So this is how we approach science. It doesn't go away. It's, most of it stays there. Like it's built on top of it, let's say. But uh, yeah, so uh, I'm trying to remind you what was the, the uh, where quantum mechanics comes from. Where all this story. Uh, story. So you are, you are talking about H, for example. H has to come from somewhere, right? We haven't found H yet. And this plot is the reason where, this is where H is going to come from. Okay? Oops. Sure. No, the plot is correct. The, the, the classical electromagnetism needs a correction. Okay, and we have that correction now. Okay? Uh, let me briefly talk about polarization. Some of you know polarization better than I do. So I will just m mention that we are going to put a fact. It, it is going to bring a factor of two. <laughs> Brings a factor of two later on. It's basically, <clears throat> is it okay if I say that uh, polarization basically corresponds to, let's say I, <coughs> I have trapped a light in one dimension. It could have this kinds of electric field and that kind of electric field. Like it could have electric field this way and magnetic field this way and electric field this way and magnetic field that way. And the rest can be expressed in terms of these two polarizations. Is that a good uh, description of? Yes. Okay. That's another way of looking at it. So, electric, uh, so electromagnetic wave is coming towards you, and you see which direction the electric field points at. So it has E X and E Y, right? So these are polarizations. And you add time, for example, circular polarization below the circle. Yes. Polarization okay. But in any case, if I trap it, there is a factor of two coming from these two possibilities. Okay. It's going to come later on in our calculations. Good. Very, very good. Are you bored? No? Let's, <coughs> let's talk about Thomas Young. Thomas Young, the last man who knew everything. <laughs> he has that kind of a nickname. The last man who knew everything. He, apparently, he also knew Turkish language. Uh, among, like Young's modulus, right? There's Young's modulus. Then there is double slit experiment. Then he was a doctor, etc. Goes on like that. He was a polyglot. He knew all the languages. Mm. Turkish was one of them. Yes, so basically it's a double slit experiment and he sent light, right? And you think of light as a wave, as an electromagnetic wave. And if you basically send a wave like this, like a plane wave, it will come out of here like this, right? And at some parts, they will interfere constructively and at some parts they will interfere destructively and you are going to get this pattern. Do you agree? Do you remember this experiment? So double slit experiment 
shows you these pa patterns. So what's the conclusion? Light is a wave. Okay, good. So far, so good. Do you have any questions at this point? There's one more thing that we need to describe before we run into this 20th century crisis. We are approaching 20th century now. And there is, let's talk about thermodynamics. Have you started watching Einstein, genius? Yes? No? You, ha you watched it already. So you will see that uh, Einstein that we think about, who keeps thinking about E equals mc squared, uh, doesn't appear to think about E equals mc squared all the time. Instead, he is obsessed with these molecules the newly emerging this thermodynamic stuff and he, he has a lot of good ideas from there okay watch it please uh, now is the time you watch it because right now he is you will see that he is thinking about this so in thermodynamics what I want to mention in particular is Boltzmann distribution So in Boltzmann's time, it was fashionable to think about everything in continuous way, okay? Not really, like, although there were clear, maybe, evidences of atoms, okay? But it seemed like it was forgotten somehow, okay? So... <coughs> People were interested in, of course, thermodynamics because of industrial revolution. People came up with very important ideas like entropy. And entropy is taught to you still in that fashion. Macroscopic entropy, like mechanical engineering, TS diagrams, blah, 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 right? Uh, at his time, Boltzmann was a visionary and he actually showed that he can start from discrete stuff, from atoms like uh, billiard balls, and derive those macroscopic entities that we call entropy, energy, Helmholtz free energy, whatever. All those could come from Boltzmann's theory of uh, kinetic energy, uh, no, no, kinetic theory of gases, right? Well, what is one of the most important <coughs> discoveries there? It's this one. So let me, let me sh draw you something. Yeah. Here's a box of a gas, and it consists of gas atoms. Can I duplicate this? I think if I draw it bigger, I would be able to duplicate. So they are moving in different directions. <laughs> okay, this one is bumping into each other, etc. Right? Uh, I think. It's not a good analogy, I know, but imagine that you all have some amount of money, okay, and it's, you can share any amount, so you interact with each other, you, you give some money to the other person, and the total money is there, okay, but it, the money idea will come back and it will make sense later, okay? So let's say you want to give someone 200 liras, they would accept it, okay? They wouldn't say like 200 liras is not 
uh, important money for me. I don't want to accept it. That will not be the case. That will be the case later on. Okay? Right now, classical thermodynamics, everyone accepts all kinds of currency. And there is a distribution. Uh, the system will go towards a certain distribution after a while. Okay? What is that distribution? That distribution is Boltzmann distribution. And the energies will be distributed like so. Okay, what is this? Uh, okay, this is not exactly the probability. There is actually Z underneath, but don't worry about Z. So this is basically proportional. The probability of being at energy E is proportional to this. This is probability of being or having energy of E. Or if you are more like precise, energy of E between E and delta E. Do you care about that? No. E. E it is. Okay? So if you plot it, the probability of having energy E goes like this. So most of the atoms will have very low energy, right? But some of the atoms will have very high energy. And this is the distribution. Exactly. Kb is Boltzmann's constant. And it connects to other constants. KB is 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joule per Kelvin. Okay? Do you remember what was its connection to? Uh, I can see from 10 to the minus 23 that there has to be 1 over Avogadro number here. But what was on top? R? The gas constant? Yes? I think so, because it's 8.31. Divide by 6.02, 10 to the 23. Do you remember this gas constant from macroscopic? So he derived all this, all these relationships. Okay, yes. Yes. Why do we have high temperature? Temperature is a parameter that you set into the system. The temperature, temperature could be high, in which case, uh, so. But temperature is not a variable. No, 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 no. It's a parameter. So if temperature is very low, if temperature is very low, then your probability looks like this. If temperature is a bit higher, then it looks like this. If temperature is even higher, it looks like, okay. Yes? x-axis is energy, y-axis is probability of being at that energy. So the higher the temperature, so what does it mean? Can we say that there, there is more currency in the economy and there are more people with more money? Because uh, there is also a relationship between temperature and the total energy of the system, right? Okay. Now, did I derive Boltzmann's distribution? No, I didn't, right? But if you are curious, it comes from uh, the following. So Boltzmann describes entropy as the summation of probability of being at energy at a certain energy times ln of probability of being at certain <coughs> energy with a negative sign. This is his microscopic, what is, uh, let me also put KB if you are worried about that. Well, 
Yes, uh, and Boltzmann and Shannon are the same. Okay. Uh, I think Shannon didn't know about Boltzmann when he derived this. Yes. Anyways, uh, later on there is information theory, and it w it was I think it was rediscovered by Shannon the information entropy, but it's the same entropy. Anyways, now it's all connected. Anyways. Uh, what is this? We have to have a separate lesson about this, lecture about this, why this is the definition of entropy, etc. And we are not going to do that, okay? But if you maximize this value by setting a constraint on the total energy, okay, so total energy must remain the same, but you want to maximize entropy, right? then you get Boltzmann distribution. That's how you get it. Okay? Very good. Yes, he did commit suicide. Uh, this is just, it can happen to anyone. It's depression kind of stuff. But I think it was furthered by the fact that he was really, really ahead of his time. Like, he, when, when continuous stuff was fashionable, he was into this discrete stuff, and he couldn't get his ideas through to other people, I think. I think that contributed, but it can happen to anyone, really. Equipartition. theorem. So again, something that I, I will not derive, okay? But still, let's see what it means, okay? It tells us that each degree of freedom gets one half kBT of energy. Okay, what does it mean? <clears throat> we were just talking about a gas, right? There's a gas, and how many degrees of freedom do we have? Let's say we have n atoms, and each one of these atoms are free to move in three dimensions. They can move in X, they can move in Y, they can move in Z, right? Okay, yes. So three, three N degrees of freedom, degrees of freedom, corresponds to three N times KBT over two. So the energy of the system, the internal energy of the system is 3n times kBT and over 2. And you do know this from macroscopic thermodynamics, right? Uh, I think it comes out, do they derive it in macroscopic thermodynamics or do they just say that this is the case? This is the case, right? So this comes out of Boltzmann's meticulous uh, Microscopic treatment. What? What do you mean by that? Like you have three velocity components. It's just three degrees of freedom, but also you have the x, y, and z. Yes, but you don't have very good question. You don't have potential energy attached to it. So you have to have potential k x squared over two kinds of stuff, so that you attribute yet another k b t over two to that. Okay, I will come to that. Uh, okay, so do you have any questions And at this point? No? Uh, okay. Let me gather my thoughts really quickly. So I have to talk to you about heat capacity. Okay, so can I write it like this? 3 times n times n Avogadro times kBT over 2. 
and this is number of moles. Do you agree? Yes? So I'm going to define heat capacity like CV as heat capacity. It will all be relevant, okay? Per mole, heat capacity per mole will be 1 over N del T over, no, del U over del T. Okay, so if we plug it in, we get CV for ideal gas as 3 kb times Na over 2, which is 3 times gas constant over 2. Okay? Don't forget this. This will come back. All right. Do you have any questions at this point? Yes. Yes, very good. Let's come to that. Let's talk about diatomic gases now. Okay? For example, diatomic gas. Okay? Very good. So let's say I catch two atoms, just catch them in the air. How many degrees of freedom do they have? Six right now, right? Six. What happens if I connect them with a stick? I connect them with a stick. How did you get it? Okay, very good. Um, can I think a little bit? Or we, for example, if we connect these to each other, we are removing two movements, motion, the X motion and Y motion, when we are fixing the distance. Okay, the way that I would look at it. By the way, these I, I draw them as balls, but they are really they really don't have ra radii. We ignore their radii, okay? Because then you have to think also about their rotation as themselves. But what we are thinking about here is we usually treat this as following. So now that they are together, we are thinking about this diatomic molecule by itself moving in three directions. So three plus, plus the two axes, like it's like this. So it can rotate like this or it can rotate like this. This rotation doesn't count, okay? So my answer would be five. And it's also so no, no, no. It's, it's a stick, so it doesn't have oscillation, okay? So how many? Yes. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the way that we think about it Do you see it? Yeah. Very good Everybody is happy? In, in, it has a radius that is fixed. 
if if it's a spring? Ah, if it's a sphere, then uh, for each atom we get another two, I guess, right? Or three, three. We get another three for each of these atoms, but we we assume that they are point particles. So what happens if you have instead of a stick, you have a spring? What happens then? Six again. So, actually it's seven, but I will tell you why, okay? <laughs> so for these ones, for these ones, it's like there were Vx squared coming from this one, Vy squared, Vz squared, Vx squared, Vy squared, Vz squared. Do you agree? Those are the kinetic energy terms. This one has Vx, Vy, Vz, of the center of mass plus uh, omega in one direction, let me say this direction, and omega that is perpendicular to that direction. Okay, it can rotate. Now this one, this one has Vx, uh, okay, let's use the same idea. Let's use, since they are now connected, I'm going to go with these three directions in which the molecule can go as a whole, okay? A center of mass can go. Then those rotations, omega this and omega that, right? And then there is the vibration. Now there is this. Let me call it R, okay? Uh, but R has... A, there is one coming from their kinetic energy, but another one coming from their potential energy. So whenever you see a spring, you don't count one degree of freedom, but you count two. Because not only there is a kinetic energy due to them moving like this, like kinetic energy part, but also there is a spring part. There is a potential part there. So this one counts as two degrees of freedom these had five, so we have seven degrees of freedom. So for a diatomic gas, so monoatomic gas has heat capacity of, uh, some of you are looking to others, wondering whether they understood it. <laughs> uh, so I don't know, uh, don't worry, okay? It will be fine, okay. Here, is, here it is. If you have a diatomic gas, like spring-like gas, then CV is going to be seven, of, 7 over 2 R. Okay? It was 3 over 2 R, now it's 7 over 2 R. Okay? Just these are pieces of information. Another pillar, another pillar. What do you expect? You expect from classical understanding of nature CV to be 7 over 2R. Will it be the case? <laughs> we will see. Okay? Actually, uh, CV for diatomic gases um, is 5 over 2R, and for multiple atomic gases it is 7 over 2R. Oh, is it? Yes. Yeah. Are you sure? I don't think so. Just look at it. Ah, okay. I will tell you why with quantum mechanics. <laughs> Is it? Okay. Okay, we will figure it out. Okay? Because even this is not going to be 7 over 2 at certain temperatures. Uh, your knowledge lacks quantum mechanics. Basically, I mean, diatomic gases, they are not considered in a uh, spring model. They are not considered, they are already considered in bar and Here's what happens, like, 
uh, I just just wait for me and and okay 20th century crisis is coming okay <laughs> these are the crises okay so let me just uh, we don't have enough time to go through all of them so what should I do let's then linger on this heat capacity for a while okay it turns out that if you take I'm sure about the carbon, now you have confused me about O2, but for carbon monoxide, let's say, let's say your situation, it sh should be seven over two, right? But uh, you can check these thermodynamic tables. At the end of the day, you go as an engineer and read the tables, right? <laughs> but when you read the tables, you will see that it starts off with 3 over 2, goes up to 5 over 2, and then goes up to 7 over 2. 3 over 2, and this is 3 over 2 R, 5 over 2 R, and 7 over 2 R. At certain temperatures, T1, T2, this is temperature. Okay. That's a different story. So CP has uh, CV plus R, right? Yeah. So that's uh, so we are concentrated, and CP itself has also this problem. It will also go, but on on the top it will have an extra R. But the problem is that you take into account this classical understanding that uh, explains everything. But then you do the experiment, you expect here 7 over 2, but you don't get 7 over 2. So something is missing. This is just. I'm so glad you did actually high temperature 7 over 2. For yes, yes, for high temperature. Yeah. But low temperature, you don't get 7 yeah, over 2. You get 5 over 2 first and 3 over 2 because like, the vibration modes are still locked. Don't spoil it. <laughs> well. <laughs> We have spoiled it many times. You can spoil it, but we have little time anyways. So, 20th century crisis. We have now arrived at 20th century crisis. Besides all kinds of political <laughs> crises, there were serious crisis in classical physics, okay? So, we have a problem with black body radiation. I mean, okay, black body radiation. Do you remember this plot that looked like this in experiments? Classically, it should have looked like this. So there's a problem. Okay, uh, we will derive why classically, so next one is why, why it should have looked like that. Interesting? Uh, do you remember this plot? Uh, this, this light coming from the sun, you remember? So the x and y axis are frequency and du over df. So that's one problem. What's the other problem? The other problem is this heat capacity at low temperature. Okay? Then there are three more problems, but let's talk about them. Hydrogen atom, yes, spectral lines spectral lines the other one is photoelectric effect and rutherford model and collapse of atom
So I will talk about all this in detail. So these are all the separate pillars that we have erected so far. And one theory will rule them all, will fix them all. Okay? Any questions? Good. Take care.